Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and we'll be talking about the Gospel lesson for Passion Sunday. Now, I've chosen uh, John chapter 12, 12 to 19. Um, any pastor knows there's, a, there's two different texts that are traditionally read on Passion Sunday. Uh, first and early in the service, John 12, the text I'll be looking at, and then the longer Passion narrative uh, from the Gospel of Luke this year, which would be Luke chapter 22, 1 through 2356. And because you have two full chapters there, I'm focusing the podcast on the Palm Sunday uh, Gospel, namely Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Uh, although I will comment at the end of the discussion of John chapter 12, 12 to 19, on elements of Luke's passion narrative, namely chapters 22 and 23 of Luke, that dovetail with this. So if one preaches from the Palm Sunday Gospel, one can also connect and bring out aspects of the Passion narrative for that transition into Holy Week. Uh, Palm Sunday is sort of double-sided in the sense that it has that emphasis on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, the joy of him coming in to, uh, to redeem and save, but then it switches with the reading of the Holy Gospel to a strong focus on the Passion. Uh, the reading through of the Passion narrative from Luke shifts that focus into helping people see Jesus has entered Jerusalem to die. And it really kind of gets people ready for then Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then ultimately uh, the following Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord. So we'll turn our attention first to the Greek text of John chapter 12 on the, on the uh, board, the whiteboard. And then we'll uh, summarize by actually showing some connections between John 12 and Luke's passion narrative in 12, 22 and 23. Uh, if we turn to the text, you can see here that... Um, uh, as John presents the entry of, of, Jerus of Jesus into Jerusalem, he's emphasizing here uh, that uh, on the next day, uh, so just giving you a time marker of when this happened, and then he mentions the fact that there was a great crowd. Uh, Josephus, in talking about the Passover, emphasizes just the abundance of pilgrims. We don't have exact numbers. Josephus tends to exaggerate by uh, pushing the numbers up to two to three million. Uh, not that many, but certainly there were a lot of pilgrims in Jerusalem for Passover. And so no doubt when John mentions this great crowd, the one coming, you have the participle with the definite article tying the, uh, the whole phrase, the one coming into the feast or coming for the feast, that's a description of this crowd. It is a great crowd that was there because of the feast. So not only do you have the Jews who are residents of Jerusalem, but you have all of those who have come to celebrate the Passover feast uh, as part of uh, making up this population that now is, in a sense, hearing about Jesus and interested. And it also notes that uh, with this participle, uh, it's an aorist participle, so it's action having happened prior to the main verb. The main verb is found at the beginning of verse 13. So after they had heard that, and here's your, your verb for this um, dependent clause, after Jesus had entered in Jerusalem. So after they had heard that Jesus entered Jerusalem, that's when you have now the main verb, they took who? This great crowd took um, the, um, the, basically the branches of, of palms. And here, it's probably, uh, Jerusalem wasn't known for, isn't known for abundance of palm branches around, but there were palms growing in the, in the nearby area. For example, Jericho is known for its palm branches. So it's probable that they, after hearing that Jesus was entering in Jerusalem, went and gathered these. It is very significant. Uh, we're, we often do this on Palm Sunday where we actually have members who carry palm branches. 
it's a, a very significant custom in terms of, of recognizing royalty is to actually have something that's laid down before them or something that, and so palm branches has a, a rich heritage in, in this um, region uh, as a way of, in a sense, acknowledging the royalty. And that's, I would say, of anything as an overall emphasis um, is this theme of Jesus entering as king. And one of the things that signals that already is this emphasis of the people taking up palm branches and then going out. You have the verb, uh, the two verbs. They first take the palm branches and then they go out uh, in order to meet him. They go out um, uh, to meet him uh, as he is coming in. And then you have the imperfect verb here uh, where uh, Ekraagzon uh, is could be understood with this imperfect form, could be understood either inceptively, namely they began to cry out, uh, or it could be understood as repeated activity. Uh, and I think the, the second one is probable here, that they actually were repeating this phrase uh, in terms of what they're singing. They said it more than just once. So what was the phrase that this great crowd who is there for Passover, who had heard Jesus entering in, so they, they're going out specifically to welcome him, what are they saying? Uh, it begins, it's a quotation of Psalm 118, verse 28. And it's interesting how it begins. It begins, Hosanna. This is not a translation into Greek. This is an actual transliteration of the Hebrew, which means, Hosanna means, um, save us. So it's, in its earliest form, is actually a prayer. A prayer to God, a prayer to Yahweh, to save. Uh, and one can say that... Uh, Certainly, it's also used in the way of almost a, 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 a word of praise. But uh, I think here, one might say, John understands this uh, rather literally, namely that it's a way in which the crowd is calling upon Jesus as a king to deliver them, to save them. Now, maybe they didn't, didn't understand what they needed to be saved from. Maybe they had more of the popular conceptions of uh, needing, uh, wanting Jesus to save them from the current bondage by, by Rome and the like. But, but John understands it theologically, that here you have the crowd using the words of Psalm 118, which is a royal psalm of welcoming, uh, where you have now the crowd calling upon Jesus, Hosanna, save us. Why? Because they really do need salvation. What is the salvation they need? A salvation from sin. And that's precisely why he is coming into Jerusalem, is to bring them the salvation from sin that they truly need. So there's a lot of, of um, theological import. There's a lot of irony in terms of this prayer and then how Jesus is going to answer it through his own uh, death. And then you have the, uh, the, uh, the titles. Uh, you have blessed is the one coming, the participle there, present participle, the one who is coming. It's certainly, uh, this is a psalm of, uh, of welcoming, a psalm of entrance. Uh, and it's uh, the one who is coming in the name of the Lord. I like to say, this is somewhat of a simplistic way of looking at it, but I think it, it kind of helps people understand there is a, a bit of a play of, of both Jesus' divine nature, his pre-existence, as well as his, his human nature, namely as a descendant of David, as king. So you have that right here in the second title, the king of Israel. So Jesus is both, he's the blessed, <clears throat> blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus is the one who is coming in the name of the Lord. Background for that is the one who comes sharing the name of the Lord. 
the one who is none other than, um, uh, such as in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord had and shared the name of the Lord. Exodus 23, 20 is a great example of that. And, just a minute. So you have this phrase, uh, coming in the name of the Lord, Exodus 23, 20, the angel of the Lord shares the very name of the Lord. So when Jesus is coming in the name of the Lord, he's one who is none other than the Lord coming. He shares the very name of Yahweh because he is Yahweh incarnate. Uh, that's, um, uh, if you look at John 5, John 5, 43. My uh, whiteboard writing is not very good today, but <laughs> uh, if you look at John 5, 43, it mentions there that Jesus says, um, I came in the name of the Father. He, I, I've come sharing the name of the Father. And so he is that one who is, shares the name of the Father, bears the name of the Father, is of one essence with the Father. So he is the one coming in the name of the Lord, and he's also, you know, here one might say, uh, is reflected his, his humanity, his human nature. He is also the king uh, who is a descendant from David. He's the Davidic king, the Messiah, the king of Israel. Already in John's Gospel, you see the mention of Nathanael. Nathanael in chapter 1, 49, uh, mentions that Jesus is the King of Israel. So that theme is introduced very early, and now it really blossoms in the Passion narrative. As I said earlier, uh, the major theme of this text uh, that fits so nicely with Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, is the kingship of Jesus. It's something that's emphasized of all places that Jesus is seen as king. It's especially in the Passion narrative. And where, uh, how, what kind of king is he? He's one that comes not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. And certainly that is, is illustrated in the Passion narrative. But the kingship of Jesus is a big theme of the um, Palm Sunday uh, text, the entrance text. Going on to verse 14, you have then the participle simply is recognizing that Jesus, uh, at the subject, uh, after finding, so you have an aorist participle, after finding a young colt, here's your main verb, Jesus sits upon it, upon this uh, young donkey, so the young donkey uh, right here, and just as it has been written, so you have this perfect participle signaling things have been written in the Old Testament prophets. Notice you have two Old Testament texts. First of all, Psalm 118, and now you have a quotation that's found in all four Gospels from uh, Zechariah here, 9, verse 9. And uh, it is, uh, behold, um, your king, excuse me, uh, starting with verse 15, uh, do not fear. Very typical uh, uh, language of the, um, of the Old Testament, certainly also of, of the resurrection accounts. Don't fear, stop your fearing. Why, uh, daughter of Zion, uh, again, speaking to, uh, the kind of language of, of Israel, uh, this is the language right out of Zechariah 9, verse 9. So, do not fear, stop your fearing, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king, again, notice the repetition of that phrase. Jesus is entering Jerusalem as king. Your king is coming, present tense, and he's seated upon um, the foal or colt of a donkey. So this is the language of, of Zechariah that we see fulfilled in this scene. 
Why is this section from Zechariah so important? Well, if you read the whole bunch of uh, the chapters that start with chapter 9 all the way to the end of Zechariah, which is chapter 14, you see there's a lot of talk about the end-time king who will come and how he will bring you know, purification, he will restore uh, Israel. And so people are looking forward to that time when this king will come. And John is announcing, in Jesus we have the fulfillment of this rich prophetic hope of Zechariah, of the end-time king coming who will bring deliverance. Uh, the whole business of him being seated, as it notes, first of all, that Jesus is seated right here on a uh, young donkey, and then here, the colt of a donkey. Uh, in, so in bo both 14, uh, in, excuse me, in verse 14 and in 15, uh, the thrust of that is certainly not just the humility of Jesus, but the Old Testament background for that is found in King Solomon, in 1 Kings, uh, where Solomon follows David. Uh, and how is he brought to his, uh, to his um, inauguration, namely to his actually becoming king, following his father David? If you look in these verses, 1 Kings 1, 33, then 38, and then 44, you see that in those verses you have, um, of 1 Kings, you have Solomon coming in on a donkey. And so this is very much, the prophetic hope in Zechariah is very much showing that one day there will be the, the fulfillment of God's promise given in 2 Samuel 7, to King David, that his kingdom would last forever and there would be one day a king who would bring this to fulfillment. Now that now this is happening, now the one who, who is greater than Solomon, but who is certainly David's lord and David's son, who is a descendant of, of the whole Davidic kingship, this is now coming to fulfillment. And just like Solomon followed David entering into Jerusalem on the donkey, you have Jesus entering in and that Davidic line, as Solomon did, on a, um, a donkey. So verse, it also, one can say in terms of preaching this, uh, it, it, um, the, the humbleness of, unlike the, um, the, the Romans who came in in their, their big steeds, their, their powerful horses, you have uh, Jesus entering on a donkey. So there's a contrast, one can say, between the power of Rome versus the humbleness of the Davidic king uh, who is entering to serve. Verse 16, <clears throat> you have mentioned here, this is very uh, interesting in, in John, at several times uh, it mentions that the disciples didn't first understand these things. And here the subject is the disciples and did not know or did not understand these things, namely what was taking place through Jesus' uh, entry into Jerusalem at first. Namely, when it was first happening, they weren't putting everything together. Um, they weren't uh, connecting all the dots, so to speak. However, but when Jesus' subject was glorified, that is a reference to after his death. Uh, after um, he had uh, fulfilled um, uh, what uh, was said in terms of delivering through his death, and then after he was risen from the dead. So after his glorification at the cross, whenever in John you hear the language of glorification, it's actually referring not to the, to the ascension or not to the resurrection, but to the crucifixion. So when Jesus was glorified, i.e. when he was lifted up on the cross, then they remembered, the subject is here again, the disciples, they remembered that uh, these things, and then you have the paraphrastic construction with the verb plus the perfect participle, these things had been written and that, he, uh, and, and that they did these things to him, namely, what is being said about welcoming him into Jerusalem as a king. 
So it was, one might say, uh, the light bulb went on, not as Jesus was entering Jerusalem and all this stuff was happening, but it went on later. One might say, uh, we have a very rich understanding of the significance of this language of uh, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, because we see not only the significance of this happening on Palm Sunday, but we also see and we use it in our liturgy. Uh, this is found in our, our uh, divine service. Our divine service liturgy, where we use this expression, Hosanna, uh, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We use it uh, in the Sanctus. Um, and why? Because just as the people of old were welcoming uh, Jesus into Jerusalem and acknowledging him, uh, so also now we welcome him as he comes to us in the Lord's Supper, in the divine service, specifically through his very body and blood, uh, where he is present uh, and we welcome him as our king. So there's a nice connection in terms of this whole text with then the uh, service of communion that most of us will be observing on Palm Sunday, again, Monday, Thursday, and certainly climactically in Holy Week on uh, the resurrection of our Lord. Going back to verse 17, you have the, uh, the fact it's mentioned, here's your subject, the crowd, that the, uh, the crowd witness therefore, and it has a big uh, qualifier, namely a modifier on who this crowd was. This is the, the crowd that was with him when Lazarus, uh, you have the whole business of Lazarus being called, when Lazarus was called out of the tomb, this is John chapter 12. Obviously, all of that happened just a little bit earlier in John in chapter 11. Uh, and was raised from the dead. So, uh, the crowd, which crowd? The one that had actually just witnessed this great event. Why are these people welcoming him, viewing him as somebody who can really do something about their predicament? Because Many of them had either witnessed or heard what had happened uh, when Lazarus had been raised from the dead. John makes a big point of the fact that uh, it, is the, the, the it is the raising of Lazarus from the dead that was the real impetus to some of the, the interest in Jesus in Jerusalem during Passion Week. And also why uh, some of the authorities wanted to be sure to snuff Jesus out because they thought, He's just gone too far with the raising of Lazarus. Once that gets out, uh, there's no stopping him. So that crowd is the one who is bearing witness. They are setting Jerusalem abuzz with, with who Jesus is and what he may be doing. Uh, so they are bearing witness to him because of what they had seen and now uh, how they had welcomed him. And obviously, this whole emphasis of of uh, Jesus having called Lazarus from the tomb is just a foreshadowing of what he would do by coming out of his own tomb. And it's a, the, the raising of Lazarus is a foreshadowing of Jesus' own resurrection, which we will obviously be um, proclaiming in just uh, one short week from Sunday. Then in verse 18, on account of this, uh, you have this mention that um, on account of this, they went out to him, namely the crowd, uh, when they had heard this, uh, uh, namely that he had done this sign. Uh, so you have the, the perfect tense here, uh, you, when they, they had heard that he had done this sign, namely the, the seventh of the seven signs in John is the raising of Lazarus. And then you have the contrast, instead of um, uh, unlike the crowd being excited about what Jesus uh, had done, 
and looking forward to more, you have the opposite reaction. Uh, some were excited, others were rejecting. Therefore, the Pharisees on the other side, uh, in contrast to the crowds, said to themselves. So this is what they are talking among themselves. And you have the imperative. Uh, see, uh, uh, because um, you have the emphasis, see, you are not able to do anything. So what are the Pharisees saying among themselves? See, you can't do anything to stop Jesus. And then again, another imperative, look, the world after him, the world is going out after him. Now, it's a very significant statement that the world is doing this. It's the Pharisees' hyperbole of saying, just it seems like everybody's going after Jesus, and we have to be concerned about this. But in John's Gospel, there also is this sense that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Not only Jews, certainly he has come for his people, but also Samaritans, and it is interesting, in chapter 4, verse 42, Jesus is called the Soter of the world, the Soter Cosmu. And he is the savior of not only Jews and Samaritans, but also, it's interesting, shortly after this, you have Greeks, Hellenes, coming to Jesus, and then Jesus saying, now is the time I'm going to um, the cross. Why? Because people from the whole world, Jews, Samaritans, and Greeks, have been brought to faith in Jesus, and thus the whole world. Uh, one might say, God so loved the world, and now you have people from various um, people groups coming to faith in Jesus. And uh, so it's a, it's a very loaded term and one that certainly is signaling the universal nature of what Jesus is doing by giving his life. I have just a few concluding comments to tie this in, because if you're preaching on Passion Sunday, one of the things that you're doing is you're transitioning the people's thoughts from the triumphal entry to Passion Week, to the fact that Jesus comes in to die. And if you look at Luke chapter 22, 1 to 23, there are several themes from John 12 or from the triumphal entry that you see re-emphasized in the Passion narrative. For example, in Luke 22, verse 27, Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. He's the one who comes not as a conquering warrior, but comes as the one seated on the donkey in order to serve how? By giving his life. Uh, by, he comes not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom, to serve in that manner. Luke 22, verse 33. Simon says, I am ready to go with you unto death. However, what he doesn't realize is that Jesus' whole mission is actually to give his, himself as a sacrifice for sins, is actually to die. And Simon couldn't, or obviously wasn't willing to go with him unto death, but Jesus willingly went unto death. You also have the whole prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is in agony. Jesus is wanting this cup to depart, but yet he says, your will be done. He willingly faces the wrath of God. The cup is a symbol for the wrath of God. Why? In order to deliver us from the wrath of God and sin. Luke 22, 41 to 62, you have the betrayals by Judas and Peter. The contrast between human weakness and yet the human who did not buckle in the face of temptation, the ultimate temptation, Jesus is obedient. Jesus obeys where his followers fail. Then you have several times in the Passion narrative, Jesus being depicted as a king. Big theme here. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And throughout the Passion, what's above his cross? Jesus is king of the Jews. What does Pilate ask? Chapter 23, verse uh, 3, are you the king of the Jews? And how does he live out his kingship? By being nailed to a cross and by 
from that, that throne, which is the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. Unique element of Luke's passion uh, reading. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And even to the thief on the cross, the sinner, what does he say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, and finally, at the end, um, the righteousness of Jesus is emphasized in Luke's passion. He is one who is perfectly righteous. What does the centurion say? The ESV does not get it well. It says this man is innocent. Uh, actually, um, the, the Greek text as dikai sune, this man was a righteous man. Uh, Jesus was perfectly righteous, giving himself as the perfect righteous sacrifice so that we might be made, uh, declared righteous through him. Uh, we pray the Lord's blessings upon your proclamation of um, Palm Sunday, at Passion Sunday, and especially throughout this uh, most holy of weeks.